I'm Natalie Durham Jenko. I run something called the Environmental Health Clinic at NYU in New York City. I'm here at the Anthropocene Curriculum. The Anthropocene Curricula is, has gathered um, 40 or so faculty and a few hundred students or participants to draw on and understand what kind of knowledge production is relevant in the Anthropocene when humans dominate the biogeochemical processes of the world. Uh, as part of this curriculum, I've initiated the Tree Office Berlin, so Tree Office Berlin 0076, because all the trees here are numbered. This was the first place, Germany was the first place where they did a tree census, when they counted and valued nature. Um, and valuing nature is one of the seminars I'm participating in, in addition to a seminar called Anthropogenic Landscapes. Um, but the tree office is a public experiment, or a lifestyle experiment, that asks us to explore what's it like to work in a tree, given that we our laptops, our cell phones. We don't need to work in an office or in a cafe, we could work in a tree. Why not work in a tree? What's it like to work in a tree? Um, and I can tell you it's pretty wonderful. The glistening spider webs that are up there, um, the lovely sound of the rustling leaves. It's enjoyable, of course. But the, <clears throat> the conceit of the tree office, an office in a tree, with internet and locally generated power is um, <laughs> The conceit is that it's owned and operated by the tree. The tree is the landlord. The tree is profiting from its use, right? So you get a text from your landlord tree if you're, you know, the opportunity to reimagine our co-working spaces, to reimagine how we work, is part of what I would call the crisis of agency, right? What do we do? in the face of so many overwhelming challenges. What do, what do I do as an individual, as a collective, as an institution? The tree office is one example of redesigning our work practices in response to these environmental challenges. Can we redesign our relationship to natural systems? Certainly changing a light bulb, riding to work, reusing your shopping bag. These are necessary but radically insufficient. Do we have creative agency to transform our relationships to natural systems? And I would argue that the best way to explore that is not through models or simulations or policy or other responses that um, you know, the good work that many people are doing, but actually a visceral experiment in, does this work for me? Does it work for the tree? Who's profiting? Who wants this here? How does it work? How does it work for me? So I'm building an international network of, of tree offices. Each one of them posits a question for different communities. Um, the idea of a tree as a landlord is actually consistent with the rights of nature movement. It's, um, instru you know, it's an example of um, the, that is extrapolated, if you will, from the Bolivian Rights of Earth document uh, that Ecuador has also signed on to. But the rest of the international community has been a little bit queasy about extending rights discourse to non-humans. I would argue that this is a critical and important uh, project that sets up a really interesting contrast to the traditional ways in which we value nature. So in New York City, for instance, uh, but it's similar in every major city has, has done a valuation of their urban forest. An urban tree, an urban street tree, for 80 years of service 
is valued at $400. That's for all the carbon sequestering, air quality improvements, habitat provisioning, energy savings from shade provisions, stormwater retention, and other environmental services that that tree provides. So it's a service worker, if you will, but a very low paid service worker. And $400 is not consistent with my sense of value of a tree, right? A parking lot, a parking space is worth more than that, right? It's, I think in New York City, you pay $480 for a month of, um, uh, to park a car. Some. So for 80 years, that's the environmental services model of uh, the tree service. And I would argue there's very different ways to take the numbers that we put on things and the cultural question that proposes of how do we use those numbers? That's a cultural question, right? What do we do with those numbers? And in the case of the tree office in New York City that I built previously, the first in a growing network of tree offices, the tree with 25 members who used it for their workspace to finish a dissertation and a screenplay and to have some events there and to, meetings and um, the tree was generating on average $400 a month, right? Um, as opposed to $400 for 80 years. And what does a tree do with that kind of profit? Well, of course, it spends it in, in its own interest. So we augmented the soil around with biochar, a waste energy byproduct that uh, not only augments the soil, increases the soil biodiversity, but sequesters carbon for about 5,000 to a million years, which is much better than sequestering carbon in a forest, which is about two to 300 years. Anyway, we sequestered the um, carbon and augmented the soil. We did some companion planting for the tree, and we also sent three of the saplings off to college. So there was less um, compaction around the tree because of the tree office. The tree benefited quite palpably. And this idea that the tree is in fact an executive in a incorporated company called Ooze, which is zoo backwards and without cages, that's another story, but the, this company in which the tree is an executive officer, of course companies have personhood and by putting non-humans on the board and as executives, they acquire the personhood of a company. So in many ways it explores the different legal, physical possibilities that we have in redesigning our um, relationship to natural systems and the simple pleasure of working in a tree. And with that argues that how we quantify and how we value nature is really a fundamentally cultural question that invites tremendous opportunity for participatory ways to understand what is a desirable future. Is it delightful to work in a tree? I would argue, yes. I'd much prefer it to Starbucks, right? Or certainly in my university office. So um, uh, the tree office as a public experiment, as a lifestyle experiment, is one contribution to the Anthropocene curricula that I would argue is an example of the kind of experiments and explorations that each one of us wants to do, will do, must do, in order to reimagine our relationship to natural systems, in order to redesign our relationship to natural systems. The pharmacy is a project associated, uh, spun out from the Environmental Health Clinic. It's spelled F-A-R-M, pharmacy. So it's a farm, a flower farm at the moment, um, but really a platform for exploring food and food systems that actually improve environmental health. So the food movement, which I would argue, it's not hard to argue, that it's the biggest social movement in the world, right? Um, and reducing food miles and reducing petrochemical fertilizers and reducing pesticides that's all good, it's all necessary, but insufficient, right? We have to design food and food systems that actually increase water quality, build soil, increase biodiversity, right? Improving and increasing our shared environmental health. And that sets the bar at a radically different level, right? Changes the opportunity, 
completely. So the pharmacy is exploring those systems that increase our shared environmental health. And part of that, uh, one example is a platform called AgBags, which is Tyvek, uh, which you know from a FedEx envelope, it has incredible tensile strength, but is a synthetic felt. So these H uh, high density polyethylene fibers are heat welded together, they don't have any binders that leach into the soil. These um, create uh, bags that allow us to drape any railing, parapet, double hung window to create arable territory out of thin air using existing urban infrastructure that we have everywhere to um, a closed system, that is, they don't, there's no water runoff, um, <clears throat> a closed system platform soil-based that improves air quality, supports pollinators, and uh, explores delicious new foods. So one of the problems with urban agriculture in general is that they grow the same things, like in Brooklyn, New York, they're growing the same things competing directly with the struggling family farm seven miles up the Hudson, who don't have pref you know, hundreds of volunteers who live in Brooklyn, um, or preferential access to chefs. And so they're actually directly undermining or undercutting the family farms and the rural food shed that we need to support. So I have a non-compete agreement with our rural food shed that is, um, what is the foods that we can grow in an urban context that we can't grow in a rural context, right? We can't pretend that urban agriculture is the same as rural agriculture. It costs about, some estimates, two orders of magnitude more. So a $17 tomato that can be grown for 17 cents um, in the rural. Anyway, what is it that we could grow that doesn't compete? And my argument is high nutrition value, high commercial value, highly perishable, non-distributable foods. What's that? Flowers, of course. Flowers are the most nutrient-dense foods that we know of. They're high color signals, these powerful antioxidants, these lycopenes, and you know, the phytochemicals that, that we need in the big cultural shift that we're going through, where we used to understand food as calories that you burn, energy that you just burn, didn't matter what it was, or that it was these macronutrients. And now we understand the value of micronutrients. So this view from calorie, this move from calorie-based food to nutrition-based food is a huge cultural shift. And flowers could play a, a big part in that. Um, the other thing is that the things we grow in the ag bags are uh, high shoot to root ratio plants, right? perennials that have a lot of leaf area index. And the only known technology that we have for improving air quality, air quality is our number one human health, environmental health risk, um, implicated in the asthma epidemic, the cardiovascular uh, issues, even in diabetes um, the, and, and obesity. Uh, air quality is more toxic now than it has ever been, even though it looks cleaner. It's these very fine particles that um, it actually enter into our pretty pink lungs and circulate in our cardiovascular system. Um, so we have a technology for improving air quality in urban contexts that's actually radically inexpensive. What is it? Leaves. Leaf area index is the technical term. And we have, in fact, uh, recent studies in the Midwest where the emerald ash borer has come through taking out just a few of the urban of the trees, the ash trees in the urban forest, which at most is about seven percent, and the length of time and the severity of the ash borer, the emerald ash borer um, blight, is highly correlated to an increase in morbidity, mortality, and hospitalization, cardiovascular stroke, and asthma. So we have a, a wonderful natural experiment. Probably wonderful is not the word, but we have a natural experiment which quantifies, you know, everything else is held the same, the same activities, and we change one thing, taking out a few trees, removing a few leaves, and we see the um, tremendous effects on human health. So the pharmacy produces a platform that we can um, 
improve air quality, we can um, grow these, explore these delicious new foods. And, uh, and also, who else likes pollinators? Uh, who else likes flowers? <laughs> um, who else likes flowers? Pollinators. And in the middle of a pollinator crisis, the idea that we could support diverse, wonderful pollinators is critically important. So um, it's one example. The problem with using flowers is that most people don't know how to eat flowers except to sprinkle them on a salad or on a cupcake. And so we have to develop new foods, flower foods. Um, again, food innovation, to expect the rural food shed to do that, to not only um, produce food but to do the value adding, that's something that needs to be done in an urban context, in a rich urban cultural context. So for instance, the black pansies that we grow, if we don't use those black pansies within a couple of minutes of picking them, they lose all their delicate volatiles and they are tasteless. So we flash and fuse them into vodka to make the most delicious black pansy vodka you've ever tasted. Or flower floss, which is actually looks like cotton candy or cotton floss, but is actually um, isomalt, which the, is the major ingredient in Metamucil. If you have a sluggish gut, you know. Um, you'd be familiar with that product, but the, it's optically clearer than sugar uh, and it doesn't produce that GI spike. In fact, as a fiber, it kind of fosters biodiversity in your lower gut. And so we take this floss, we put inside a color-changing LED and sprinkle it with bee pollen and delicious edible flowers and we have a taste of a biodiverse future. That is, a good good, the production, the consumption of that good increases biodiversity in your lower gut and in your local neighborhood, right? So the net positive is to increase biodiversity and human health. Another example of pharmacy that we've um, done recently is being cross-dressing buildings. So we print onto the Tyvek, which is a great outdoor banner material, and we are I cross-dressed a building in, on, uh, in Chelsea where we took the facade and covered it with a, um, a sign uh, and of course that sign could advertise whatever you like. It also grows these delicious edible flowers, supports pollinators and increases the leaf area index for the human health benefits of, of improved air quality. So that is a very concrete example of a really important idea that has been almost totally erased from the popular imagination and even from the academic imagination. And I discovered it only, well, it's, it's sort of, I rediscovered this idea of mutualistic systems design. Mutualism is interesting. It's very interesting. It's very interesting because most of the world's biomass is produced, is, is mutualists, are mutualists, is, are. They, um, that is, that subset of symbiotic relationships that we call mutualism, where both parties benefit or many parties benefit, right? Now, in high school biology, you probably heard about a mutualist. I mean, all the flowers, all the forests, all the, you know, every terrestrial plant just about, all the corals, they're all mutualists, right? But we hear a lot about selective pressure. We hear a lot about predator-prey relationships. We hear a lot about competition for resources. We don't hear so much about mutualism, right? <laughs> That's how natural systems work. Both parties benefiting, right? Why don't we hear much about that? So the Signs of Life project, which is this cross-dressing buildings in commercial sign space, inflorescing these barren urban surfaces, is a concrete demonstration of mutualism mutualistic systems design. So you can advertise, promote whatever the hell you like, right? It might be Krispy Kreme donuts, it, you know, whatever that organization or, or commercial science base wants to promote. But at the same time, you're also supporting pollinators, improving air quality and human health benefits with it, um, and um, exploring these delicious new flower foods, right? Fundamentally, mutualistic systems design. And I think if we move to and demand these systems, if we re, I, you know, I'd have to say, I think 
redesigning our food and food systems so that we increase biodiversity, improve, with a build soil, right, the fundament of, of civilization, and uh, increase human health. We um, can do this through mutualistic systems design. And I'd also have to argue that human and environmental health, the <laughs> is the best proxy for the common good, right? Something that we can measure, something that does not polarize, right? So you can have people who are pro-development or anti-development. You can have people who are pro-business or anti-business. You can have left wing, right wing, you have, but no one's anti-health. So I would argue that anything goes as we redesign our buildings, our urban infrastructure, our lives, our, anything goes if it measurably improves human and environmental health. That's the best proxy for the common good that I've found, that we can work with. And mutualistic systems design is an extraordinary idea that nature has demonstrated again and again and again. It's all around us. We don't even see it, but it's an invitation to explore our productive new set of relationships to natural systems. The Environmental Health Clinic at NYU, um, which spun out the pharmacy project, operates very similar to a health clinic at a university um, in so far as I'm faculty and it's supported by the university. And anyone who comes to the clinic, it provides a kind of familiar institutional context, right? Who you can just call up and make an appointment, right? Um, anyone who comes to the clinic is not a patient. They're called an impatient because they're too impatient for, to wait for legislative and other changes to address our shared environmental issues. But people come with their environmental health concerns as opposed to their medical health concerns. And they walk out with prescriptions and projects that actually address and improve their own environmental health as opposed to um, pharmaceuticals. So this, this is kind of an external view of health, where health is not um, something that's internal and atomized and individualized, medicalized, pharmaceuticalized, but something that's in the air quality that we are sharing and the food systems that we depend on, our shared water systems, right? This, these external determinants of health. Since Hippocrates, who wrote Airs, Waters and Places, um, and argued that to treat the inner one, one must treat the outer, have an incredibly important advantage. That anything, uh, you know, as opposed to popping a pill or a silver bullet approach or the germ theory of health, um, the atomized idea of health, anything I do to improve my own air quality, my own food systems, my own soil biodiversity, the benefits are enjoyed by anyone I share that air or food or uh, earth with, right? This idea of aggregating small collective effects into a substantial um, shared environmental uh, and human health benefit. So institutionalizing that has been challenging, but what's interesting is that there is a whole set of people who have started off as impatients or um, would like a kind of clinical context to actually do small-scale experiments. So we have now an emerging network of environmental health clinics, one in Mauritius, Toronto, Manchester, Chestertown, Boulder, Melbourne. Um, and these are places where young designers and other people have decided, oh, that makes sense, right? I could be an environmental health physician. I want to work on those kinds of projects. I want to be accountable to our shared human environmental health using playful and visual strategies that, um, that work to enlist. Um, so for instance, the pharmacy project where we're inflorescing these barren urban environments with flowers um, or the butterfly bridge where we use, uh, it's a butterfly bridge, right? It's uh, planted with butterfly attracting plants um, with a banner permit, right? That goes across the road connecting patches of ecology. So 
butterflies and other valuable pollinators bounce across the road instead of being smeared on your windscreen, um, safely you know, increasing the genetic flow and the resilience of these pollinated populations, guiding them to these fragmented but healthy um, pockets uh, of ecosystems in our urban environment. So these are visual strategies, right? And the interesting thing about visual strategies is they infect many eyeballs and the palpable sense of something's different. There is change happening is in itself a tremendous symptom of the kind of transformations that we're exploring. So the visual strategy, much better than you know, solar panels or a green roof that you probably aren't even aware of, um, or whether or not your neighbor uses wind power and pays a premium, you know, those kind of invisible strategies don't give us the palpable sense that we are, if they can do it, well, I can do it, right? This, this idea that we are collectively able to determine, to change, to improve, to explore, to experiment with our urban infrastructure, our shared urban environment. So the idea of facilitating those kinds of experiments works very pragmatically. In fact, we do something called an anti-MOOC, not a MOOC, um, massively online open courseware, um, which uh, uh, posits that um, there's one expert who's educating through the world. In our case, in the Environmental Health Clinic, this international network of, of clinics, um, we do is anti-MOOCs. So I have an experiment going on the shoreline of East River, or the unshore line, as I call it. And there's a similar experiment going on in Wellington or in Melbourne or in Mauritius, where we are building muscle choirs, living infrastructure of muscles, right? And uh, we gather weekly online to, to explore, well, did you get a permit? How did you do it? What worked for you? What didn't work for you? So while it has to make sense in a local context and use local resources and convince local you know, participants, it transcends the local to become generalizable as we compare and contrast the experiences and are able to make the kind of powerful knowledge claims, truth claims, about what does and doesn't work. We learn much more from doing it together than we would do learn from just implementing one context. So um, the other way, the, uh, the new arm of the Environmental Health Clinic that I initiated with Cassandra Fraser, who's a chemist at the University of Virginia, um, is called Doctors Without Disciplinary Borders. And in this way, we can affiliate the many different experts and scientists who um, are tremendously interested in applying their knowledge to this, if you will, through this clinical uh, context in doing real experiments with local communities about what works. How much does a tenfold increase of leaf area index in a, in a city block with the pharmacy strategy where we're inflorescing these um, railings and we're trying to work on JFK, the front door to New York City at the moment where we're taking the massive concrete parking structures and, you know, filling them with flowers, right? How much does it improve air quality in a really air quality compromised context that really has devastating um, human health effects on people who work there and all of us who come through this um, context? So how much that, does it work? Who does it work for? How does it work? This requires, if you will, um, many different experiments. We need to let many flowers bloom, if you will. To, because our shared urban environments, our urban ecosystems are irreducibly complex. We know they um, cannot, no single expertise, no single experiment, no single model actually can explain or explore the kind of complexity that we really have to deal with. So I would argue that this methodology of small scale material experiments is the only way to work in these irreducibly complex contexts to explore what is possible, what works, and who it works for.
I'd like to elaborate on this crisis of agency with a, a story that I think illustrates um, the kind of material, political, social, and cultural dimensions that we have to simultaneously, and of course, uh, environmental dimensions that we have to simultaneously address. So recently, last summer, Creative Time hosted a sandcastle competition, and they invited me and my cross-species construction firm to come along to create a sandcastle in this competition. And this was on the eviscerated, or the formerly eviscerated, beach at Far Rockaway Point that Superstorm Sandy had basically taken everything away. The big um, boardwalk had been picked up by the storm surge and rammed into buildings and cars. And, uh, and what had happened subsequently is the Army Corps of Engineers had come along and put the, the boardwalk back where it was, reloading the gun, right, and uh, uh, put sand, dumped sand, tons of sand back on the beach that had disappeared. And so we had the sandcastle competition and I brought along um, organisms that were involved in building beaches, right? So to ex you know, explore the living infrastructure that uh, is, you know, if we collaborate with, um, it's a much less expensive way to rebuild resilient uh, shorelines, or as I call them, unshorelines. Um, one of the organisms, in addition to the duckling beetles and the, um, the mussels and the uh, macrophytes that um, I brought along, was a, a fish that I'd found at the Petco in Union Square when I was looking for diggity fish. And this kitlid fish was by far the most uh, diggity fish. I'd sort of been scoring them all. And actually, the people at the store said, take that fish, you can have them. <laughs> Apparently it was such an aggressive fish. He was so diggity, he was defending his territory so much in his little sand um, area that uh, he'd killed a couple of other fish. And he'd been given to the Petco by a good Samaritan who had found him in a, on a plastic bag on the street in New York City. This street fish had um, come in. So I was given this fish and he came out to, beforehand we had given him some pebbles and some sand to see how diggity he was, what kind of patterns he would produce, how he would build a sandcastle, and he was extraordinarily active. But when I took him to the sandcastle competition, I put, put in the local sand, which was the, the um, rules of the competition. You had to use local sand. Um, he sulked. He did nothing. And we didn't win the sandcastle competition, which I blamed on him. <laughs> um, each, of the, each of the organisms, the mussels actually put on a great show. They put out their long tongues, and they were building sandcastles with their tongues, which if you ever need to know how to do, um, there's some lovely video of it. But the, um, each of the organisms was named after a local politician who had produced public space. So this was Enrico Penalosa, the fish, who I was cranky at. And I took him back home. And I had this problem that um, in this little pocket ecosystem with the local sand, I kept getting these algae blooms. I'd never had an algae bloom problem before. So I kept emptying out them in the water and I, I um, kept putting it back and uh, get another algae bloom. Weeks pass and then I had to go away for three days and I came back and the algae bloom had gotten so bad in my absence that Enrico Penalosa the fish jumped out, suicided rather than inhabit. And I tried to resuscitate him and it was only then that I realized oh, the algae blooms must have come from nutrient-rich sand. That sand wasn't from another beach. It was probably mined somewhere up in upstate in Pennsylvania and being dumped. So in addition to being shocked by you know, Superstorm, this ecosystem was now leaching nutrients into the entire, uh, you know, the entire beach. Um, nutrient enriching, getting algae blooms, killing anything else that did survive, right? Um, as my little pocket ecosystem showed. And so um, the subsequent example um, is to learn from that sort of experiment and, we've, um, and take uh, the option, what do we do, right? Um, so in Lord of the Rings, you might remember there was a, um, a chain mail projection system. Um, and the New Zealand company that makes that is polycarbonate chain mail. It's a translucent 
thing that's now used as building cladding. But some good things come out of the movies, right? So this building cladding is a total game changer when it comes to our relationship to delicate ecosystems. So the boardwalk that, um, that the Army Corps put back there, you know, ready to, you know, to um, be a battering ram in the next superstorm again, um, could in fact be like other boardwalks in, you know, across dunes or wetlands, um, could in fact, instead of having a rigid surface, could have this polycarbonate chain mail and planted underneath it the dune grasses and the skipper moths that bounce around and depend on those dune masses, uh, grasses and the diverse organisms that actually secure beaches instead of the tradition of boardwalks that we have that in fact desertify and kill all possibility of biogeochemical processes that go on underneath those boardwalks. They don't happen, there's no sun, right? They become cigarette butt holders, right? Um, so this idea that we could in fact uh, do a public experiment where we insert some of this polycarbonate cane mail, as it's called, um, and show the organisms lighting the, um, their spectacular dune building, beach building, beach securing work um, allows for people to have an experiment <coughs> with that. Riding their bikes over it, they're pushing their strollers. Um, it's not actually great for stiletto heels, but, um, but great for walking on or jogging on, and for displaying the spectacular biogeochemical processes that are so critical. And of course, by doing this small scale material experiment, we change the popular imagination. People can see, oh, this is great for cycling, not so great for rollerblading, but oh, when the next storm surge comes along, the water will go straight through, right, rather than picking it up. Changing the demands on their local politicians who are so-called fixing the problem, and worse, the stranglehold on the public purse of these big engineering firms and Army Corps who by law has to award it to the to their lowest bidder, right? And by the whole professional structure of the engineers that um, that build and design our infrastructure, that we that socialize the risk, enormous profits. You know, it's galling how much um, I mean I have the same degrees but um, but I don't get paid like that. And the question is to whom are they accountable? If it's not human and environmental health, why is the public purse being allocated in this way without any experimental processes, without any accountability to human health? In fact, endangering human lives um, in the, under the mask of of fixing the beach, right? So here we have an example where the material evidence, a small scale public experiment, makes very complex ecosystem dynamics and biogeochemical processes evident to many different people who can change what is demanded of the public resources and the shared public infrastructure, and of course, improve you know, what we would what well, is just intuitive, that if it's good for organisms, if it promotes biodiversity, if it works for non-humans who are smaller, uh, you know, if it doesn't poison the fish, um, it's probably uh, much better for us. Of course, the major, main source of many industrial contaminants like mercury in human bodies is from fish. We're, by treating their health, we're treating our own health. And this idea that we can design, we can design systems that actually are accountable not to cost engineering or to you know the RFQ, but to human and environmental health. How many kids are hospitalised due to asthma? You know, what counts is our shared human and environmental health? That's the best proxy for the common good. And organising small-scale material experiments changes the politics of who participates, who demands, who understands, and the vocabulary of what is possible and what is desirable.
institutionally redefining and reimagining our institutions beyond the simple gesture, beyond the occasional project, I would argue for the capacity for us to address the Anthropocene. That is, what is our response to this coinage of the Anthropocene where humans dominate the biogeochemical processes of the planet? What is our response ability? What is our ability to respond? Who has the ability to respond in some way? And I would argue most of us feel unequipped, you know, without the expertise. Who am I to, to act, right? So that lack of permission, the lack of authority, and what's happened with science, the authority of science, the good work that many scientists have done to front page the climate destabilization, the globalization of this problem, to say this is a problem for all of us, right? The problem with that kind of framing, global biodiversity loss, global climate change, is by definition, you can do nothing about it, right? I can do nothing about it. It's a global, you know. So I don't even hear about the extirpation of a species from my local park, which I could do something about. So reframing environmental issues as health issues and health issues as environmental issues means it places it in, within our capacity to act. In fact, it makes it urgent you know, to improve the air quality, the food systems for me and my children. And it's not about the polar bears in the Arctic, which of course it is. It's a reframing that gives us the possibility to act and to aggregate those small actions into collective action. And so what we've seen is that the ineffectual capacity of an international community to act meaningfully has become, you know, the states themselves have tremendous difficulty acting. Cities have become much more important agents. And within those cities, it's actually particular neighborhoods and community boards and blocks and small organizations that are the actors. And that's great news for us because that invites every single one of us and harnesses the most extraordinary um, re uh, renewable asset we have which is human intelligence and the creative power that each of us has to reimagine, to explore, to figure out what works. I'm sorry, I don't think some policy wonk in can provide an answer and you know, a few tweaks of a system to, you know, it's the, comp the problem is far too complex irreducibly complex. So what we need is institutions like the Environmental Health Clinic, you know, a familiar institution that people know how to use, right? Or the pharmacy, a f slightly familiar institution that people recognize, or these unsure line experiments, or ooze, which is zoo backwards and without cages, and updates the idea of the zoo which uh, is incarcerates animals in these categorical bo boxes, <laughs> obfuscating the very thing that we need to represent, which is how these complex ecosystems with many different agents manage shared territorial resources. Frankly, non-humans do a much better job of it than humans do, right? And we can learn a great deal from that. So I mean a very diverse set of what I would call human and non-human actors in our shared urban environments. Uh, in fact, one example of a project called the Muscle Choir is, I think, a good example of this, because particularly here at the Anthropocene curriculum, we're talking a lot about simulations and models um, of global climate change and local um, environmental ecosystem dynamics. The Muscle Choir is um, blue mussels, who are the heavy lifters of water quality improvements that uh, we've co-evolved with over millennia, 
right? The midden piles um, that are geological in scale that appear wherever human civilizations have really been successful, demonstrate that we've had a close, some would argue our frontal cortex is uh, owed to our the inexpensive, ready intergenerational access to high levels of EPAs and DHAs that are required for creating a membrane rich brain, right? That we needed muscles um, in order to do that. So we've, you know, all our hard edges we've created um, in our cities for promenades and for bike paths as we've reclaimed the, the waterfront. Um, you know, we have to go beyond that and populating it with muscles. Um, is being led by the muscle choir. So these are muscles that have been instrumented with, with uh, a little magnet and a Hall effect sensor so we can tell how they open and close. Of course, their behavior tells us a great deal about water quality, right? Because their lives depend on it. I trust a, a muscle's behavior more than I would trust a scientific paper on water quality or the EPA published data um, on water quality, right? Um, the muscle is believable. Um, because, and it's a biologically meaningful representation. So I take that opening and closing and I turn it into song. And the song, it's a, the muscle sings, um, you know, what does a muscle sing? Actually, you know, Daisy, Daisy, if you ask Siri to sing you a song, she, he, it will sing you um, a bicycle belt for two because that's the song that Hal sings uh, in 2001 as it, uh, was turned off, right? This is the icon of AI, this idea, artificial intelligence, this idea that we can take computational models and, you know, put in as many parameters as is computationally possible and model the complexity of the world and understand the world through a model, predict the future with the model, right? That's one view. There's a kind of the opportunity, um, actually, Aaron Coblin, uh, the opportunity that new technology provides to rethink our relationship to natural systems is interesting. And distributed intelligence, like we see, I think, in um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk, was taken as a different, um, also took Bicycle Belt for Two and made a Bicycle Belt for 2000, where 2000 Mechanical Turkers sang ah, ah, and they were assembled into a Bicycle Belt for 2000. The Muscle Choir, their first hit single, has been a bicycle built for too many rather than a bicycle built for 2,000 or for two, to iconify natural intelligence. This idea that we can draw not just on computational models or very low paid Amazon Mechanical Turkers, but in fact the intelligent responses of many different organisms to understand and represent the complexity, the irreducible complexity of our shared environment, right? In this case, water quality. So they sing a bicycle built for too many and have coming out with a, a number of other hit songs to really popularize this idea of natural intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence that invites the great capacity that we each have to respond our response ability to the Anthropocene. I see the future as desirable. That's the future I want to see. And so the question is, how do we produce a future? How do we produce a desirable future? And I see technology as an opportunity for social and environmental change. Fortunately, technology typically is very resource in intensive, so it's usually deployed in the interests of resource-rich organizations, corporations, or the military. But technology also has an um, extraordinary kind of uh, quicksilver unintended consequences. The complexity of technology means that we can seize it as opportunities for the kind of social and environmental change that we're interested in exploring. So I would like to see the kind of participatory processes, the participatory research, the convivial, 
visual, playful, spectacular strategies that invite the tremendous diversity of human intelligence and experience to contribute to, to explore, to co-produce a desirable future. I think it'll be um, biodiverse and tasty and delicious and desirable if I or the people that I know have anything to do with it. Because we do have agency and we can exercise that agency. We can explore and we can only produce what we desire.